All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so what we're going to do is um, continue our discussion on structural loads. Um, a point that I'll make right off the bat so that everybody understands what's going on, um, today is probably going to be our last common day among courses because we're probably we're going to finish our notes today. We already finished them last uh, period, so we're going to finish them in here as well. So um, uh, after today, you need to be coming to both if you're in both. Um, so a little bit for agenda for today, I'm going to continue our discussion on structural loads, and then I have a present for you, a, uh, a, a homework assignment. I don't think it's a, a very intense one. There's only two problems, um, and it should be fairly straightforward. If you understood the tributary area concepts uh, last time, then it should be uh, pretty, pretty rote. Um, okay, so <coughs> going back into our, our discussions, so we, last time we defined what dead loads were, and, I, and I've corrected my, my slides, and now it says 150 pounds per cubic foot for reinforced concrete. Uh, again, that's a very good estimate um, for reinforced concrete, and it's going to be a, a fairly common value we use in this course. Um, if you're dealing with lightweight concrete or something like that, that number's going to change, but all in all, for design purposes, that's a very good estimate. Uh, steel weighs 490 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, if, I, if you don't remember those numbers by the time you get out of here, uh, I will have failed. Um, <coughs> so, but that will happen. Uh, that you will use those numbers uh, fairly significantly. Um, now, that, those are dead loads. Now, the, for common materials, it's pretty easy. Um, there's also some common floor and dead load values that you can look up. Again, if you uh, have a component in a building that you need to determine the loads on, you can either um, uh, look it up in ASC 7 or you can call the manufacturer. But the big thing is just making sure that you're accounting for all of the load that's within uh, uh, a given uh, element or that uh, all the load that a given element uh, is supporting. <coughs> now that's dead load. That's the structure's, essentially the structure's own self-weight or anything permanently affixed to the structure. That's dead load. Live load, on the other hand, is what the structure is being used for, its occupancy. Are we talking about schools? Are we talking about churches? Are we talking about hospitals? Are we talking about uh, office buildings, uh, ice skating rinks, bakeries, nuclear power facilities? Live loads are associated with what the building is being used for. Now, last time we, um, we you know, started to look at some of these values, we say, well, okay, if I've got a, an office building, that's 80 pounds per square foot for the corridors above the first floor. But what does 80 pounds per square foot mean? Like, how do you visualize that? So this is some images out of the LRFD pedestrian bridge spec just to kind of give you an idea of what these live loads look like. So this is about what 50 pounds per square foot looks like. About 12 people in a six foot by six foot square. That's uh, 50 pounds per square foot. This is 100 pounds per square foot. <coughs> and this is 150 pounds per square foot. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, that's a lot of people. And um, I did a little bit of mental math and uh, looked at this room. And according to typical classroom loads and using those images as a reference for density, there should be about 100 people in this room to uh, reach the uh, desired uh, live load. Now, what are the chances that this room is going to have about 100 people in it um, all day, every day? Pretty low, right? I mean, again, as, as Lee said, I, I'm not that popular. So, um, <laughs> so because of that, um, what we can do is we can account for the probability that that live load will not always be there. And we can therefore reduce our live load for the purposes of design. Now, I show you this equation, and, and I think this is where we stopped last time, so I'm going to take a little bit more time and define what's going on with this. Um, but all too often, I think, in courses like statics, like mechanics of deformable bodies, like structural analysis, <coughs> you get used to this concept that you know, I've got the physics, I've got the calculus, I've got the mechanics, I can derive all the equations that I need. You know, here's an equation, I can derive it, I can, you know, do all the derivation to get an answer of two. You know, and, and for a large component of what we do in 
structural engineering, that tends to hold true. I mean, you have a simply supported beam, you have a uniformly distributed load, the maximum moment at mid-span is WL squared over 8. And you can define that, you can derive that, it's easy, it's straightforward, okay? What gets tricky are the issues and challenges that aren't so straightforward, okay? How do you account for the reduced probability of uh, live load over a given area? Or, or things like, um, how do you predict the rupture strength in, uh, reinfor or in for concrete materials? Um, for, if it was something like steel design, how do you predict shear lag and tension members? Okay? Those are complex questions, and they don't have easy answers. But we have to address them. I mean, that doesn't mean the problems go away. We still have to be able to address them. And that's where empirical relationships come into play. I go and I instrument a structure, or I do some experiments, I collect some data, I analyze that data, I throw it into Excel, see if I can find some trends, see if I can find some patterns in the data to try and predict these complex issues, okay? See if I can take this really complex issue and boil it down to a simple, straightforward, curve fit equation. That's what you're looking at right here. This is an empirical relationship that relates unreduced live load, L sub naught, L sub naught being like these values that you would look up in the code. <laughs> this equation relates L sub naught, these unreduced live loads, to the expected live load that you should use for design. So this is the relationship between unreduced and reduced live loads. Okay? Now this equation is a function of two parameters. Number one being the tributary area. I have got to believe by now you can compute the tributary area, right? Okay? Tributary area, and then this K sub LL, this live load element factor. We'll get to that here in a second. For now, though, I want to look at this box because there's a couple issues that need to be addressed with what's going on inside here. First off, live load reduction does not apply any time that this quantity is less than 400 square feet. And there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, if you actually take a value that's less than 400 and plug it into that equation, this term in this parentheses will end up being larger than one. Or other words, you'll actually, instead of reducing the live load, you'll actually amplify it. And that's just because it's a curve fit equation. There are some limits to it. But that, that's one reason. There is another reason. If you have KLLAT less than or equal to 400 square feet, you're talking about a member that's not responsible for very much area. It's a really small area. So by that very notion, you, you think about it, is there really much value in performing the reduction anyways? I mean, it's such a, a small area, you might as well design the member for the full load anyways. It's only when those members are responsible for a whole lot that live load reduction starts to have its benefits. Does that make sense? Everybody all right with that? Okay. Now, that's number one. A second caveat is that in most cases, and there are a couple provisions here and there where, where this can be changed a little bit, but in most cases, the live load will not be reduced any, case, any time that the original live load is over 100 pounds per square foot. Now, to give you an example, let's think about this. Let's go back to the classroom example. I said that, you know, the, for the design load, we would need 100 people in here. And what are the chances that this room would see 100 people in it? And the answer is not very likely. Now, on the flip side, let's say that we were talking about the third floor in Drinko Library, okay? What are the chances that a floor beam in Drinko Library really does see 150 pounds per square foot? Pretty high, right? And why is that? Because of the book stacks. They really, those beams really are going to see 150 pounds per square foot. So does it make sense to reduce that live load? No, it doesn't, right? Makes sense to do that operation here, but not there. So the way the code addresses that, it says if you have an original load that's greater than 100 PSF, you better leave it as is, okay? Excuse me. Everybody good? Now, there are a couple additional caveats. Um, for instance, if you perform live load reduction, whatever you get, you are limited to 0.5 of the original load if the member's only supporting one floor. So if you have 
let's say, a floor beam that's being subjected to 80 PSF. You can reduce it, but only up to 40 PSF. Beyond that, you just tap it off at 40. That's for members supporting only one floor. For members supporting multiple floors, you're allowed a little bit more reduction, but only up to 40%. Everybody good? Now, that's everything in a nutshell except for one thing, and that's these live load element factors, these K sub LLs. What, what do these mean? Okay. Well, I can show you this table and you can look them up and, and ultimately they, they really will be a look up, but I want you to understand where these values are coming from. So, and we'll do a little bit of artwork, see what I can come up with. Okay. So, what I want to do is I want to look at this uh, floor frame, which Keep in mind, this is the same floor frame we looked at earlier. So by that logic, would you agree that all of these floor beams, individual interior floor beams, they're identical? In other words, they all have the same tributary area. Would you agree with that? So if I look at any one of them, it's going to be the same. All right. So let's just pick a random floor beam. Would you agree that if I look at any one of these floor beams that, let's see, that Would you agree that for the most part, that rectangle, that shaded rectangle, that is the tributary area? A sub T. Would you agree with that? Halfway over, halfway over. Okay? Now, that's the tributary area. I am now going to introduce a new term called the area of influence, the influence area. Now, what's the difference? The tributary area is defined as halfway over to the next adjacent member, right? Tributary area, halfway over. Influence area is all the way over. So if I look at an individual floor beam, the influence area is going to look something about like this. Everybody see that? Okay, so this is the influence area. And the influence area is defined by KLLAT. Okay, so let's look at an individual floor beam. You tell me, okay, if I've got the tributary area and the influence area, and those are my two areas. What does KLL equal in this instance? What's that? Well, let, let me ask it like this, okay? What do I need to multiply this red rectangle by to get the area of this blue rectangle? Two. Does everybody see that? What is KLL for an interior beam? See, see, see what I'm getting at? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, now, let's, let's do another one. Let's look at a column. Would you agree that for a column, that that red rectangle represents the tributary area? Would you agree with that? So if I shade that. By the very same notion, if the tributary area is halfway over, the influence area is all the way over. So the influence area, whoop. Let me see if I can pick this down. That's better. So the influence area looks something about like that. Is that a fair statement? So what do I need to multiply the area of this smaller inside rectangle to get the area of this larger outer rectangle by? Four, right? Because think about it like this. 
that red rectangle is really just that, right? So that times four is going to give you that, right? What is KLL for an interior column? It is four. Does that make sense? That's the difference between the tributary area and the influence area. You can look it up or you can assess it like that. Everybody okay with that? All right. Any questions? Okay. So let me be clear. At this point, my expectation for your ability to do these calculations uh, stops. And what, what, I, what I mean by that is I don't expect you all to do any significant calculations for uh, snow load, wind load, and seismic. I do, however, want you to have some understanding of, of what's to come. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to very briefly go over uh, snow loads, wind loads, and seismic just to give you kind of an idea of where this stuff's coming from. And on your homework assignment, you're going to compute some of these base values using some, some pretty nifty online tools, I think. I think they're pretty straightforward. Okay. So to start off, I want to talk a little bit about snow load. Now, where do you get snow load? Well, like any uh, of these loads, you get them from the specifications, but where are the specifications getting them? Well, there's a series of weather stations across the United States that are measuring uh, ground snow loads in given areas. So every now and then, these snow load maps will get updated from time to time. I mean, not extensively, but snow patterns do change every now and then. So there's a series of weather stations across the country that are measuring snow load data. And, and what we use from a design standpoint is what we call the 50-year snow. In other words, what is the predicted uh, snow in a given area? So to give you kind of an idea, here you, you open up ASC 7. The first thing you're going to see is this snow load map. And I can hear it now. You're looking at this snow load map going, I can't read a thing off this, right? Well, don't feel bad because it's actually kind of tough to read even if you had the document sitting right in front of you. <laughs> a lot of times people will refer to the tables. So for instance, um, if you look at, I don't know, let's say Burlington, Vermont. Okay, So there's been 40 years of record. The maximum observed uh, snow is 43 pounds per, se, uh, per uh, square foot. But from a design standpoint, this 2% annual probability, that's going to be our design. It's going to be 36 pounds per square foot. Everybody seeing that? This is what we use for design. So you look at something like a like Stampede Pass, Washington. Y'all see that? That's a lot of snow, isn't it? 516 pounds per square foot. Y'all see that? That's a lot of snow. Just a little bit, right? A little bit. That's a lot. <laughs> That's like The Shining, a lot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> I've got references, man. I've got references, and I've got jokes. <laughs> Keep me going. I'll just start saying Red Room all over and over again. Y'all have seen the movie, right? Oh, goodness. It's on TV all the time. All right. Okay. So um, let me go, like, just give you an overview of how the calculations work. I do not... Um, expect you to be able to do this. I just want to give you an idea of how this works. Okay, So you start off by determining the ground snow load, and that's what you get from your base uh, snow load maps. That's what these maps are reporting, the ground, the snow load on the ground. You then have to take that snow load and you have to convert it to what is the snow load on the roof. So this is the equation for the flat roof snow load. And, and for most commercial structures, we tend to design with flat roofs. And I'm sure some of you who are H&H &H folks think, whoa, how, how does that work for drainage? Doesn't, doesn't the rope have to have some sloop, uh, slope to get the water and the snow off? Yeah, that's true, but your roof doesn't need to be like this to, to drain water off. I mean, you can have a very, very slight slope and still get drainage. So for the purposes of design and, and, and things like that, we can effectively assume that these members are flat. There's no problem with that. So how do you calculate that? Um, 
flat roof snow load. Well, you take the ground roof snow load. You start off by dropping it 70%. That's just the change between the ground to the roof. And then you adjust it by a series of factors. Now, one of them is an exposure coefficient. Maybe I should back up and just say each one of these factors are lookups. It's really like, here's the table, here's my situation, there's the value. So it's not like there's anything complex associated with it. But to give you an idea of what they mean, so an exposure coefficient, you know, keep in mind, things like wind are going to affect how much snow accumulates on a given roof, right? Well, the, think about it like this. If I have a building in the middle of Manhattan versus a building in the middle of some grand open field, the wind characteristics are going to be way different. And if that's the case, then I'm going to have a different accumulation of snow on that roof. Does that make sense? That's number one. Number two is a thermal coefficient. In other words, if I'm designing something like a, like a greenhouse, greenhouses by their very nature are heated buildings. If that's the case, isn't my snow load going to be different? You know, snow does tend to melt when it gets hot. So that, that changes the, the, the snow characteristics on a given building. And last is what's called an importance factor. And, and importance factors show up here and there uh, in different load events in buildings. And what that is is, is, a, is a, a measure of the effect of a building's and, and its potential failure on public safety and welfare. Like, let me put it like this. If I'm designing, let's say, a grain silo in the middle of nowhere, does that building really have the same risk category as something like a, 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 a nuclear material storage facility or a trauma surgical wing in a community? Is it the same story, really? No, it's not. You know, certain structures have more of a significant level of importance to a community than others, okay? If a grain storage silo fails, well, that sucks, but it, it, that's not going to affect somebody as much as a trauma wing in a hospital or, or, or what have you. Or if a nuclear power plant fails, eh, that, 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 that's bad, okay? So we adjust some of these loads accordingly, okay? It's not because the structure is going to see more or less loads, because, my God, it's just more important, okay? Now, those are so just some general issues with snow. These are some additional ones. I told you all in structural analysis that triangular loads happen. They do. Here is an instance where they do. You see here on the left there's this image of a, a, a roof that has some significant snow on it. I'd say some significant snow because this uh, establishment had a bad day. Um, as you can see, the roof uh, has some significant sag on it, just a little bit. Um, but what I want you to pay attention to actually is this uh, segment right up here because if you notice there's kind of a, a flat snow load on the uh, on the building but see how this kind of bunched up right there the snow kind of bunched up we call that a snow drift and from a distribution standpoint it's funny how we assume that that is a triangular load okay now <coughs> sometimes when you do a structural analysis of the roof and you start applying snow loads there are a couple different cases that you assume one of the snow load cases is with the drift. One of the cases is just assuming a uniform distributed load across the board. Sometimes what you find is it's actually the uniformly distributed load that governs. So you do all this, um, this math and you find that it, this triangular load stuff didn't even matter. It, it does happen. But to answer your question about 516 pounds per square foot, how much snow that is, it's not as simple of a question to answer. Um, and, and the reason why is because when you look at this, you see how you're calculating heights of snow and things like that. In order to do that, you have to calculate what the density of snow is. And that actually depends on where you're at and, and some other factors associated. It's not as simple. What I'll say is a lot. A lot. I mean, we're talking feet of snow. Mul multiple feet of snow. Very easily. So, again, shining weather. references. So. I mean, you, you would appreciate last night I was teaching finite elements and we were talking about how you assemble stiffness matrices. Remember we mentioned that last semester in structural analysis and I mentioned the Avengers symbol. 
There we go. We got some laughs. It's week one and we got some laughs. There we go. It's going to be a good semester. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that hurt my feelings. <laughs> that hurt my feelings. But at least those were real laughs. I'll take them. I'll take them. Okay. Um, in, <laughs> going back to loads, um, dead loads, live loads, snow loads, those are um, what we call gravity loads. In other words, they act in the direction of gravity. They act like this. They act downward. There are two significant load events that act in this direction, okay? One of them being wind. Just about every, I mean, every, you know, uh, structure is going to have to be designed for wind in some fashion or another. One of the things that makes wind really complicated is the fact that wind pressures change as a function of height. How many of you all have ever been on like a really tall building like the Empire State or something like that? Has anybody, anybody ever been there? Okay. Have you ever gone out on the observation deck on the Empire State? Was it windy? Yeah, it's windy. It's because when you get higher up, it's windier up there. It just is. Okay, That's a fact. Wind pressures change as a function of height. If you go to the, the Burj Khalifa, you know, the tallest building on the planet, and you look at floor beams inside that building, well, a floor beam on the second floor behaves the exact same as a floor beam on the 102nd floor. Okay, It's just dead load and live load acting downward. And that's it. But what makes those buildings complicated, what makes them tough to, to design, are the lateral loads. The loads acting laterally, like wind and seismic. And wind pressures get larger as the building gets taller. <laughs> now, from an analysis standpoint, there, there's three methods that you can employ. Now, one of them is if you've got a structure that's really complicated, shaped really funky, and it's you know a really tall structure, you know the wind's going to be funky. Just throw it in a wind tunnel, you know, and instrument it, measure its response, and use that response to design the structure. That's one way of doing it if you've got something that's really funky or really complicated. For simple structures, you've got really two approaches. You've got a, um, an envelope procedure, which is meant for more short, low-rise buildings. And it's a little more, uh, you know, here's the envelope of the building, here's the side, look up the coefficients, plug and chug. It's, it's a pretty tabular approach. I'm not going to expect you all to be able to do it. I just want you to be aware of its existence. If, um, if we were teaching a graduate course and had to look at some of these larger scale issues, I'd probably show you all the all heights method or the directional procedure. It's kind of complicated. There, there's a lot of steps to it, but it, it works more. It has more versatility, I, I would say. So that's usually the one that, that, that I would teach. <coughs> now. For that uh, all heights procedure and directional approach, we have um, a base wind pressure equation that we have to use. So let me describe what's going on in this equation. So what you're calculating is a base wind pressure, this QZ, as a function of the wind speed, V squared. So I want you to think about this for a second. We have an equation where we plug in a velocity and we get a pressure. Okay. Think about that. Now, if you want to know where does an equation like this come from, have you all ever heard of something called Bernoulli's equation? Oh yeah, fluid mechanics. Now how does Bernoulli's equation work? You have point A and point B, and each of those points have elevation heads, velocity heads, pressure heads, and what have you, right? Well, if you assume two points uh, on your scenario, point A being the wind and point B being the building, and you say for point A, we have a velocity, and point B, we are trying to determine the pressure. We assume they're at the same elevation. We plug in, well, what is the density of air? And then we plug in some unit conversions to try and get wind speeds in miles per hour to wind pressures in PSF. It's funny how you do all that math and you get a constant of about 0 .00256. So you want to know where that comes from? This is Bernoulli's equation. For those of you who haven't had fluid mechanics yet, you will become very familiar with it. So, fair statement? Okay, so that's the base equation. There are a couple of adjustments that go on to that equation. Kz is the constant where you actually calculate the effect as a function of height. So Kz gets larger as you go up, up the building. Z is your height of the building. Uh, 
KZT is your topographic effect. Are you going to get any wind, uh, wind speed up effects from the, uh, the, the land uh, surrounding the building? Uh, KD is your wind directionality factor. It accounts for the fact that the wind might strike the side of the building that's weakest, so it's taking that into account. And V is your base wind speed. For most of the regions in the country, your base wind speed is 115 miles per hour, except for regions around the coasts. Because you find that regions around the coasts are more susceptible to things like hurricanes, tropical storms, uh, and, and more significant wind effects than we would get in a place like this. And there are some areas that are special wind regions because of the topography. I'm actually originally from Bluefield, West Virginia, and we are in a special wind region uh, there. So just food for thought. All right. Everybody good with that? Now, there are a, a couple of additional uh, uh, things that you kind of need to consider. I, I'm curious. Have you ever been in a building, like a, a big building, and it's really windy out, and you walk into the building, and either one of two things happens. You open the door and you let the go door slam shut, or the doors just kind of open on their own. Is that, have you ever seen that happen? Well, and, and if you notice, it will always happen when it's really windy outside. And the reason why is because of the physics associated with the building and the wind characteristics, you can develop positive or negative pressures inside the building. So inside the building, there might be a tendency for if I open this door, for the door to slam shut or for the door to stay open. And it depends on the characteristics of the building, how fast the wind's going outside and what have you, but that can happen. Well, from a design standpoint, if you're designing that lateral load system, you have to be able to take that into account. You also have to be able to take into account things like wind gusts. You know, the wind doesn't always blow at some constant speed always. Sometimes it's, you know, a, a gust. You have to take that into account. In addition, you also have to take into account uh, wind directionality from a, a, a fairly significant analysis standpoint. In other words, um, Let's say my building is one big rectangle. Does the wind always strike it like that? Maybe it strikes it at a little bit of an angle. You know? Maybe you have to take that into account as well. So you know, it's one thing for the wind to directly strike the building. It's another thing for it to strike it a little bit at an angle. Because you can get different wind pressures on one frame versus another. It kind of make, might make the whole frame want to rotate. Something to consider. <coughs> Everybody good? Okay, now the last effect to consider are, are seismic effects. Now, again, uh, I, mentioned, I think I mentioned this last time, but I'll mention it uh, in more significant detail today. Um, seismic uh, effects do not apply load to a building. There is not a big earthquake monster pushing on buildings. That's not how it works. However, what earthquakes do is accelerate a building. Now, what do I mean by that? You're in a car with your friend. Your friend's driving down 3rd Avenue and they're doing 50 miles an hour. They hit the brakes. You fling forward and what do you hit? There we go. You hit the seat belt. You hit the seat belt. Okay. How much force do you hit the seat belt with? Well, it is your mass multiplied by how much the speed changed. And what do we call a change in speed? We call it acceleration. So that's, that, you know, that's how that force is developed. And it's the same thing that's true with a building. Earthquake hits a building. It is a lateral event. Okay? The building is being accelerated because there is a sudden change in its speed. It's going from zero speed, sitting still, to moving. So there is an acceleration applied. That acceleration multiplied by the fact that the building is not light, it has a mass associated with it, gives you a force that can be applied to the building. So you basically, for earthquake analysis, you calculate the entire weight of the building, the whole weight of the building. Um, then, based on where the building is in the United States, you have certain ground accelerations associated with it. There's your seismic shear. We call it a seismic base shear, the total base shear that's being applied to that building. Then based on building weights and distributing that load, you apply point loads to each of uh, the floors in that frame such that the sum of all of these forces equals the base shear. You know, sum of forces in the x direction equals zero. 
you then apply those, um, <coughs> excuse me, you then apply those as point loads inside some RISA model or STAD model or what have you, and then you analyze the structure according. Everybody good? Now, this is just an idea of some uh, seismic acceleration uh, earthquake hazard levels, if you will, in the United States. This comes from USGS. And it's just a couple things to point out. There are some areas that you might not think were uh, affected by seismic demand. No, they are. You really need to consider them. If you're designing a structure, let's say in western Kentucky, you have to design that structure to as stringent a seismic demand as if you would if it was in L.A. So a lot of people might not think that, but yeah, I mean, th that's true. So it's because of the location and proximity of fault lines in those given areas. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Now, anybody have any questions? Okay. Now, that's all of these individual loads, how you assess dead load, how you assess live load, how you assess snow, and all that jazz. How do you put them all together? And that's where load combinations come into play. Okay? So again, I want to emphasize our be-all, end-all base equation that governs the entirety of uh, structural design. That our factored resistance, the nominal resistance adjusted by this value phi, that's our factored resistance, must be greater than or equal to the factored load. And what we do is we calculate each individual load effect and we multiply it by an appropriate adjustment factor. Okay? <laughs> now, these are some of the load combinations, or these are the load combinations associated with LRFD. There are a total of seven of them. And again, the, to reiterate from a discussion we had last time, these load uh, factors are associated with probabilities. Like, let's take load combination two. 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. Why is the live load factor larger? It is larger because we have more, or we have less uncertainty associated with dead load than we do with live. For live load, there, there, because there's more uncertainty, the live load gets bumped up a little larger. D does that make sense? Live load's more uncertain, so we got to bump it up a little larger to achieve a uniform level of safety. So. The way this works is you'll compute your dead load effects. You'll compute your live load effects. You'll compute your snow load effects. You'll compute your wind load effects. And you'll have each of these individual values, a dead load, a live load, a snow load, a wind load, et cetera. And then you just go down the line. So equation number one, 1.4 times the dead. You calculate a factored load. Equation number two, 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live plus 0 0.5 times this. And it's just the maximum, which one has the worst effect. Make sense? All right. Then you get a value. Equation number three, get a value. Equation number four, get a value. And you just keep going down the line. And you're going to ultimately get, theoretically, seven different values. From those values, whichever one the maximum is, whichever one gives you the extreme effect, that's the one that governs. Now, for a lot of scenarios, though, if we're looking at, let's say, a floor beam in a building, we don't have to check a lot of these. Really, the only ones we have to check are the first and the second one, 1.4 dead and then 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. And to be perfectly honest, the, the 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live tends to govern most of the time. Okay? I'm not saying that's always the case, but most of the time it tends to govern. All right? I can almost guess that 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live is an equation that's going to be on all of your formula sheets this semester for your exam. Make sense? All right. Any questions? So again, you go through each of those, determine your maximum value, and then if that factored load combination is greater than or equal to your factored resist, or, or if your if your factored resistance, sorry, your factored resistance is greater than or equal to the sum of those factored loads, then you're good. Okay. Everybody good. Now, before we leave, I do want to walk you through the homework assignment that you all have which, oh yeah, you all have a homework assignment. Shucks. Okay. So, let me hand this out. I'm going to post this on MU Online as well. It is due next Friday. Okay. All right. All right. And Alex.
Okay, so problem number one, let's walk through it. So you've got a, a floor uh, frame that is L-shaped. Um, the floor beams are arranged in a different fashion to make sure you all are paying attention to the tributary area discussion. Okay, so here's how this works. This floor frame is subjected to a dead load of 35 PSF and an unreduced live load of 70 PSF. So you need to perform live load reduction where appropriate. And I'll, I'll leave that to you to determine that based on what you've seen in the lecture notes today. <laughs> and I've identified three elements in this frame that you, uh, that you need to assess. We have uh, just an interior floor beam, a girder, and a column. Okay? So you'll compute a dead load effect, compute a live load effect, and then factor it. Everybody good? Okay, that's problem one. Problem two, on the back, um, we've got uh, that problem one essentially uh, assesses dead loads and live loads. I wanted to have some measure of how uh, environmental loads work, like snow loads, wind loads, and seismic. There are some really nifty tools that are online to calculate some of these loads, so we're going to use those, and I'll give you kind of an idea of how this works. Um, to start off, let me go to Google here, and let's pick a location that we can use as an example. And my house. Now, we're not going to use my house because that's, uh, first off, I'm not giving you all my home address, nor, nor the YouTube population. And two, I would like to pick a location away from Huntington. So I guess I will pick the most awesome place that there is, which is Disneyland. Okay, now, um, a note, I'll just give you an idea how this works. A note, so um, when you use these tools, latitudes and longitudes that are to the north and to the east are considered positive. So this would be positive 33.8 and then negative 117.9. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So. What I'll do is I'll say, let's, let's try the wind speed. Actually, I want to do this in, in Chrome. So wind speed. So we'll do wind speed at Disneyland. So we'll plug in a positive 33.8 latitude. And then this is our longitude. Make that negative get wind speed. Oh, that's a special wind region, so it, it's a little different. Um, we can try something else. Let's try something a little more basic. Let's try the, I don't know, let's see. What's a good one? What's that? Walmart. Now, again, I want to keep, I want to keep a feature away from Huntington. How, how about, how about this? How about, Hoover Dam. I already I already started typing. I would have. All right. Okay. 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 Hoover Dam. Let's see. Let's see if we can get out of a special wind region. You hope it's a special wind region. There we go. Okay, so based on this region and based on our risk category, as the risk categories go up, our base wind speeds go up. Now this is again one of those general locations, like I said, 115 miles per hour is usually the case in most instances in the United States. Now that is for wind speed and, and the snow load is essentially the same calculation. For seismic maps, we have to go to the following website right here. When you use this website, when you use this website, make sure your pop-ups are turned on or turned on because it, it pops out a, uh, 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 a report. And I'm going to do this in Chrome because I did this during the last uh, lecture and I got Chrome to work. 
Okay, so the way earthquake reports work, okay, so the first thing that you do, you've got to pick your code. Let's see if y'all been paying attention. What code do I pick? There we go, or 2010 ASC, same thing. Okay, um, all right, so report title, we can say Dr. Michelson's example. All right. One of the things you'll find with, with earthquake loads is they change as a function of your site conditions. If you've got uh, clay soil versus very rocky soil, the effects of that earthquake on the building change. So we'll say it's a, a, a standard soil. And this one, however, we'll say is Disneyland, because I, I know that we are going to get some seismic effects at Disneyland. So we'll say that's the latitude. That's the longitude, compute the values, then you'll get a pop-out report. Okay, so let's look at some of these values to explain what's going on. Excuse me. So what ASC, or what, what you'll get from seismic accelerations are six values. Let me explain what each of these values are. So these two values here on the left are ground accelerations from what, what I'll define as short earthquake periods and sustained earthquake periods. So like that versus, you know, a sustained earthquake. So you'll notice this one's shorter, okay? Now, what you're looking at, see how it says 1.5 G, 0.550 G? Does anybody know what that means? Times gravity. So, so 1 G would be if, if I have a building like Here's the city, and I have a building that's standing up like that. One G would be if I took the building and just set it up like that and treated it as one big cantilevered beam. That would be one G. Okay, so that's what these values are. These MS and M1, those are modified for the site conditions. So if you play around with it and you pick different soil conditions, these will get changed accordingly. Now, that's your modified value. These are your design values. How do you get from... The modified to design, you multiply it by two-thirds. Why two-thirds? That's engineering judgment. That the code specifies that from your uh, nominal accelerations for design purposes, we'll use two-thirds of them. And, and I could spend all day talking about seismic effects and, and accelerations and what have you, but I'll just sort of leave it at that. So to go back to the homework assignment, you need to determine base wind speeds, ground snow loads, and what have you. So the base wind speed, do it at Marshall and then at the University of Miami. Um, ground snow loads, get them at Marshall and at Harvard. And for seismic accelerations, Marshall and then UCLA. So, college campuses. Everybody good? What's another fun fact? Wait, wait, wait. Your, your, your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters went to Disney World, yeah. and they didn't take you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. All right, that's all I got. You all have a great weekend. I will see you all on Wednesday. Okay, remember, class is canceled on Monday.